Well, let me begin by saying it's really good to be here with you. I'm Father Tim Furlow, Administrator of St. Patrick Parish in Portland, as you might have been able to tell from the poster that's up. That is a uh, younger, fatter, better looking version of me in the, in the poster, so I'm a little more decrepit and more bearded now, but it's, it's the same person, I guarantee you. So it's good to be here and do this sort of switcheroo with Monsignor Syak for this weekend of Masses and then also for our parish mission that we have coming up. So already, if you don't know, for the mission, we're going to have uh, a talk in the morning and a talk in the evening. There'll be the same talk each day, and then they'll be followed by confessions and Eucharistic adoration for as long as confessions go. And Monsignor Syak is doing the same thing at my parish. Kind of a cool thing to have a parish mission, actually. Most of us aren't used to that spiritual practice anymore, but I think it's a really good thing for the life of, of any church, and in particular, in this case, it's a really good thing to sort of jumpstart our spiritual life during Lent. So, today, the first Sunday of Lent. Lent is my favorite uh, liturgical season, by the way. I don't know if you feel that way. I know a lot of Catholics that just love Lent, which is kind of weird, right? Because it's the time of year where we really focus on some things that are maybe aren't so great to focus on, things that we don't enjoy looking at all the time, but it's very, very fruitful for our spiritual lives if we want it to be. This is the first Sunday of Lent, so we should be in our spiritual lives in a mode where we're gearing up to do something. So Lent is about doing things for the sake of being something, or better yet, being someone. And that someone is whoever God actually made us to be. Because this life, it just throws all kinds of things at us, and we pick up damage along the way, and that damage pulls us down from time to time. It changes how we think, and it changes how we feel, and it eventually changes how we act. And suddenly, we wake up one day, and we're not exactly who we're supposed to be. Lent is the time to reverse all of that. The church says, hey, take some time, take a good long look within, and see what you got going on inside of you that isn't ideal. What needs to be extracted? What needs to be worked on? And work on getting rid of that stuff by the power of the Holy Spirit. It's a very healthy thing to do, if you think about it. We do it in everything in our lives. We do it in our houses, we do it in our cars, we do it in our workplaces. We clean them out. We sweep them out from time to time. It makes sense that we would do that with our interior lives as well. One of the ways that we can do that, we can identify what needs to go, there's a bunch of different ways, but one of the ways is by recognizing what our temptations are. What our temptations are. Because we all have temptations, and there's a certain number of them that we can experience. There's a limited number. And some of us experience this one more than that one, right? We lean toward this, more toward that. For instance, if I walk past a table in the break room at St. Patrick's, we don't have a break room, it's so tiny, but if I walk past the only room we have, and there was a table in it, and there was a stack of hundos on the table, 10 grand at least, unmarked, non-sequential bills, hologram free. I would not have even the slightest inkling of a temptation to take that money. It just isn't something that I struggle with, stealing. But if instead there was a pint of Ben and Jerry's Chunky Monkey <laughs> on that same table, that would be a horse of a different color, now wouldn't it? Because maybe from time to time I struggle with struggle with eating a little too much, the sin of gluttony. So we all have our things, right? We have things that we know we struggle with and that we kind of don't do anything about, 
we put the pause button on, I call it, and we just let it ride, and we go on that way through our lives, sometimes all the way up to cardiopulmonary failure. Uh, and that is not how we're supposed to do it. We're supposed to stop and say, hey, uh, in a time like Lent, let's look at these things. Let's take a deeper look at them and know that they already exist and get a little bit more serious about dropping them out of our lives. So I'll let you in on a little secret. I live with another priest from Monterey, California. He's a great guy, love living with him. We love doing the ministry together and all that. But we have not fully moved into the rectory at St. Patrick's, a rectory that we began occupying almost nine months ago. There are rooms that you walk into and it looks like someone took all of our belongings and put them into a comically large cannon and just shot them into the room. You know, and then they just stayed there. And we walk by those things day after day and week after week and month after month. And we've just gotten used to that because we're so busy. We put other things above the priority of organizing those things. But we absolutely know that we should do something about it, that we should get rid of the things that we need to get rid of, that we should keep the things that we need to keep, and we should organize those things that stay in such a way that it's easy to access them and it's easy to use them. I think that is exactly like our spiritual life, our interior life. There's things, there's temptations that we've given into that we've uh, just let ride for a long time. They're like a chair in the corner of a room that was out in the backyard and maybe it was partially burned and a family of raccoons lived in it for the springtime and we know we should get rid of it but it just kind of stays there in the corner of the room and it takes up that space and it smells terrible. The chair of our gluttony, you know, or the chair of our lust or the chair of our sloth or the chair of our avarice or whatever. You fill in the, in the blank with whatever the temptation is, whatever the sin is. It's something that's there that we know shouldn't be there, but we get used to it. It's a very human thing. We're very adaptable creatures, us humans. We, we can adapt to almost any environment, and we just sort of adapt to it. When we get rid of things like that, it makes the whole room better. Just that one thing makes the whole room better. When I talk to the little kid, I don't have a school anymore, this is the first time I've been at a parish where it hasn't been associated with, with a school, but when I do have a parish with a school, I always say like, hey, it's like if you got a ham, like a real nice ham, or like mac and cheese, you went out and get some mac and cheese, and you ate half the mac and cheese, and you brought the other half back in your little to-go box, you put it in the fridge, and your mom put the pickles in front of it, and then the cheese went in front of that, and then something else went in front of that, and you just forgot about it. Eventually, within a certain time frame, you are going to tell that that mac and cheese is in there. All right? It's going to smell so bad that it touches everything in the fridge. It's just one tiny little thing of mac and cheese. But what's happened to it is it's gotten so kind of messed up that it is now affecting absolutely everything in the fridge. That's a lot like us and our soul. We kind of let something sit for a little while, or sometimes for a long while, and we get used to the smell, and we don't realize that it's actually affecting everything in our soul, absolutely everything that we think and everything that we feel. But if we get those things out of the room, out of the fridge of our soul, so to speak, then there's room for the good things. And we can use the coffee table, and we can use the bookcase, and we can use the tables and the chairs, and it becomes a livable, usable space again. That's our soul. When we get the garbage out, the Holy Spirit can really use us to think the thoughts of God, to feel the feelings of God, to fulfill and have the desires of God, to work toward bringing goodness and truth and beauty into this world, into this realm. That's the whole point. 
of us being here. That's the purpose of our existence. It's first of all to know God, and second of all to love God, and third of all to serve God. And serving God involves using well what he's given us, not burying our talents, so to speak. So here's my recommendation for us as we begin Lent and as we move into this mission, which hopefully everyone will attend Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. We're going to be talking about morality, morality in our lives, what goodness means, what evil means, what it means to be true, healthy, joyful, and peaceful, what it means to be that kind of person in the world. My suggestion is that we go before the Lord in prayer and have an honest conversation with him. We should be having honest conversations with him every day. But that we go before him, we have an honest conversation with him and say something like, Lord, you know exactly what I struggle with. The things that I don't talk about with other people. And not only do you know them, you see them all. You see them unfold before you in real time. I need you. I need your help. In this Lent, more than any other Lent that I've ever experienced in my life, I need your help. I'm serious about living like who I'm supposed to be, living like who you made me to be. That, my friends, is really living Lent. That's what I want us to do together for the next three days. I hope to see you then.